We started with the first class, then the villains, then the giant-sized additions, and Wolverine. And in the comics, that was the status quo for a while. But as time went on, the X-Men ended up accumulating a few strays who would go on to define the team for decades. So let's fancast what I'm calling the next generation of X-Men. Comment with your favorites of these guys and let me know who you think should play them before the video begins and then afterwards if you liked my pick. And let's start with the character I've gotten the most requests for since the last video. Rogue is troubled. Anna Marie had a fairly standard childhood. She was born on a commune in Mississippi to two hippies named Owen and Priscilla. When her father tried to use a magic drug on her mother, her mother got so angry she opened up a portal to a dream dimension and spent the rest of her life there. Then, Anna Marie grew up with her aunt, and when she kissed her first crush, he ended up in a coma, and Anna Marie went on the run and took up the name Rogue. While on the run, Rogue met a 200-year-old shapeshifter and her clairvoyant wife who became Rogue's new family. They tried to kill the Avengers. Pretty standard stuff. This origin speaks to one of the most important things about Rogue. She started off as a villain, working with Mystique and her Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which makes sense. Rogue was vulnerable and angry at the world. So Mystique took advantage of Rogue's traumatic past and gave her a use for her new powers. In Rogue's first outing, she took Carol Danvers, at that point known as Miss Marvel's, powers permanently, used them to beat up Captain America, stole his powers, used those powers to beat up Thor, stole his powers, and then used those powers to beat up Spider-Woman, Vision, and Wonder Man. Rogue, when used effectively, is a literal powerhouse. She houses powers. But eventually, it became too much for Rogue. The psyche of Miss Marvel began to take over her mind. So Rogue went to the X-Men for help. And they did not all want to let her into their club. She was seen as too risky. She might go bad again. This might all be a ploy by Mystique. But eventually they said yes, they could not turn away a mutant in need. So Rogue became a new member of a team that had otherwise been together for a while. Most of the members at this time were the mutants that joined in the giant-sized book, like Storm, Nightcrawler, Colossus, and Shadowcat. They all joined in the 1970s. So even though she was part of this team, Rogue was still an outsider. That was always Rogue's biggest problem. She could never connect with people. Partially, this has to do with her past as a supervillain, but it's also largely due to her mutant powers. Rogue can absorb the memories, abilities, and life force of anyone she touches. Any skin-to-skin -skin contact will do, and the more contact, the longer she keeps her powers. And this has changed over the years. Sometimes Rogue gets control of her powers and can touch you without zapping your life force. Sometimes, if she touches you, you die instantly. And sometimes, she can absorb life force from people around her. She doesn't even need to touch them. And even that power was something that was involuntary and then voluntary. Rogue's powers changed a lot, but for the most part, any skin-to-skin -skin contact, whether she wants to or not, lets Rogue absorb the memories, abilities, and life force of another person. Or God, I guess. But not computers, or ionic energy, or whatever Wonder Man is. Even under some rare circumstances, Rogue can permanently absorb powers. Most famously, she touched Carol Danvers for an extended period of time and permanently absorbed Carol's flight, strength, and durability, which put Carol in a coma. Those powers have become a default part of Rogue's kit. She even did the same thing to Wonder Man more recently, although that was Simon's choice. But this ability comes at a great personal cost to Rogue. First off, Rogue also retains a part of whoever she touches mind. Sometimes those personalities pile up and cause Rogue extreme distress. In the case of Carol, for a while both personalities existed in Rogue's head. So when Rogue made a decision, how much of that with Rogue and how much was Carol? When Rogue uses her powers, she gains a piece of someone else, but at the cost of a piece of herself. But the biggest issue is that Rogue's powers prevent her from touching another person without potentially killing them. Rogue believes she is a danger to those around her, so she frequently keeps others at arm's length. This goes for friends and family, but it is specifically problematic for Rogue's boyfriends. They can't kiss, hold hands, any of that other stuff. Rogue is a being of pure pathos, built for suffering and pity. She is the X-Men who most frequently laments the fact that she has powers and might even give them up if she could. We need a rogue who can ache. She needs to be able to convince us that maybe these superpowers aren't all they're cracked up to be. We need a rogue who can hit emotional low points hard. However, rogue is not all agony. 
When things are clicking for Rogue, she can be a lot of fun. She is known for having a bright, charming personality. She loves to throw in a southern saying every now and then. If you watch the animated series, you probably remember what I'm talking about. We need a Rogue with range, one who can wallow in self-pity one minute, and then the next is having fun and quipping with everybody else. And as I'm sure you know, Rogue's closest relationship is her romance with Remy LeBeau, aka Gambit. We'll get to him in a second, but their relationship early on is driven by Gambit's persistence. Rogue pushes everyone away, but Gambit will not give up on Rogue. And sometimes the porter's on like, okay buddy, give her a break, but it's usually sweet. As far as age is concerned, I expect they'll go for a Rogue in high school or maybe in her early 20s. There is so far for this character to go, so it makes sense you want to start young. And then we've got the accent. Like I said before, Rogue was born and raised in Mississippi and she lays that accent on thick. We need an actor who can make that accent work naturally. Previous versions. We have had exactly one rogue in the movies played by Anna Paquin. I think she was an excellent beginning to that character. Rogue was tormented by her powers. She nearly kills her boyfriend and then is captured by Magneto to be used as the core of a humanity destroying bomb. But I don't think Paquin ever really got to have the fun part. This rogue certainly had an arc that made sense. She was lonely, found some friends, and took the mutant's cure because she wanted to be able to touch people. Sure. But that's just a fraction of what makes Rogue interesting in the comics. She never got to absorb Carol's powers, since Carol Danvers did not exist in that universe, although someone like Gladiator or Monet could have shown up and had largely the same effect. But we never got the confident Rogue. One who's comfortable enough to be a real member of the team, one who calls people sugar. And part of the problem was that apart from Iceman, who I never really loved, very few of the mutants were Rogue's age. She couldn't flirt or have any fun. Like sure, someone like Gambit being around would have certainly helped with that, but you could have also thrown in Longshot or really given Colossus more of a part to help get Rogue out of her shell. We also never got a Rogue who was able to use her powers to really help. In fact, outside of turning Pyro's fire down, Rogue never uses her power to help the team, which I get for the whole monster arc, but part of the fun of Rogue is that she is a Swiss army woman. If you're fighting the Brotherhood, Rogue can use her powers to absorb Avalanche's powers, then use those powers to knock out the blob. Even without Carol's powers, Rogue should be an offensive powerhouse, and we never got to play with that. It was a real shame. The runners up. I really don't want to bother with runners up here, because I have some I really like, but I'll throw out some names that could work, like um, Mackenzie Foy, Caitlin Dever, Liana Loberato. Those are three people, they would all probably be fine. But the winner. I have two rogues that I absolutely love. One is an older rogue and one is on the younger side. We'll start with the older one since I think she's the one we're less likely to see. Lily James has everything I'm looking for in a rogue. We've seen her do a southern accent in Baby Driver. We've seen her do charming and warm in Mamma Mia Here We Go Again. And we've seen her do isolated and tormented in Pam and Tommy. Pam and Tommy is really what sold me on James. She has an electric presence that is constantly being undercut by her unbelievable loneliness. And James manages to pull off an incredible Pamela Anderson impression that would convince me she could nail Rogue's accent even without the Baby Driver experience. But here's the thing, she's 33. The perfect age for a person and a YouTuber, but still, that's a little older than I think we'll end up going with Rogue. I think she'll be an angsty teenager or early 20s. So as much as I love Lily James, I doubt she'll get the part. However, there is another, and honestly, it feels like cheating. Because who could have the experience you're looking for in a Rogue? Sure, it isn't tough to find an actor who can pull off grief and anguish, but who plays characters who use bright southern charm to mask that pain? And has there ever even been a movie about a young girl who's in love with a pushy bad boy who doesn't play by the rules, and their relationship is complicated by the fact that if they touch, she might kill him? But he wants to do it anyway because he's so cool, and she is forced to struggle with whether her happiness is worth risking the life of someone else, and what a life without personal contact even means. Like, that can't be a movie, right? Is it? Oh, it is? and it stars Haley Lou Richardson? Well then, yeah, I guess she's our rogue. Richardson was the lead in a movie called Five Feet Apart, about two teenagers, I think, with cystic fibrosis who like each other but are unable to touch because their diseases might kill one another. Not super clear on how that works, but that's what the movie says. The central conflict of the movie is Rogue's whole deal, in love with a boy she cannot touch. This is just a rogue movie. But if that wasn't enough, Richardson also starred in Support the Girls, a comedy about a Hooters-type restaurant where she plays Macy, 
the cheerful veteran Southern waitress. Richardson also starred in Unpregnant, a dramedy about a high school girl in Missouri who goes on a road trip with an old friend to deal with an unwanted pregnancy. She also plays Ava in After Yang. I don't want to give too much of the story away since it's quite good, but her character mirrors Rogue in a few unusual ways. It feels like Haley Lou Richardson has been auditioning for Rogue for her whole life. And let's say they start filming this movie tomorrow. She is currently 27, but can easily pass for early 20s, and we could end up with a rogue who left home in high school and has been on the run for nearly a decade before she is found by Mystique. Like I said, choosing Haley Lou Richardson feels like cheating, but she should 100% play rogue in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Gambit is trouble. You see what I did there? Rogue is troubled, and Gambit is trouble. I liked it. But he really is troubled. He's the X-Men your parents warn you about. Remy LeBeau grew up in the bayou, scrapping and surviving good times. I mean, it isn't quite that simple. He was stolen from the hospital by the LeBeau clan, a group of thieves operating out of Louisiana. They raised him, taught him how to steal, and when he eventually picked the head of the family's pocket, Gambit joined the big leagues. You see, in Marvel Comics, there are two separate but equal factions, the Thieves Guild and the Assassin's Guild. They don't get along. But Gambit is the chosen one prophesized to bring balance to the Force. He fell in love with an assassin named Belladonna Bordeaux, and the two were married in an attempt to create peace between the two guilds. It didn't take after Remy murdered Belladonna's brother and he was exiled. The guild pops up from time to time as antagonist in Gambit stories. I believe they are currently united, with Gambit acting as the king of both, but handing actual control of the guild off to his father, Jean-Luc LeBeau, and Belladonna. It's not important, but it was during his tenure with the Thieves Guild that Gambit's mutant powers activated. After he had already gained some top-tier thieving skills, Gambit developed the ability to turn any object's potential energy into kinetic energy. And listen, I feel the heat radiating off of the physics majors who never heard this explanation before, it's fine it all boils down to Gambit can touch things, they turn purple, are charged with kinetic energy, and explode. Purple or pink. I'm honestly not super clear on the color. It kind of changes based on who's drawing. It's usually actually closer to pink. This usually comes in the form of a magic castle's worth of playing cards that Gambit can charge up and throw with incredible accuracy. But when used creatively, Gambit's powers can do pretty much anything. Gambit can charge up a baseball and turn it into a hand grenade, or charge up a car and turn it into a full-on bomb. Gambit can also use his ability to melt things like glass, which really helps during the whole thieving business. But if we have multiple MCU Gambit appearances and all he does is throw exploding playing cards, Marvel has failed. After he left the Thieves Guild, Gambit formed an alliance with Mr. Sinister because his powers grew out of control. Gambit did some murders for Sinister, and Sinister fixed Gambit's explosions. But Gambit quit and found his way on to the X-Men after he saved Storm from the Shadow King, the X-Men villain most associated with thieving children. You yeah, know, that's a connection. Gambit's tenure with the X-Men was and continues to be complicated. Gambit made friends on the X-Men, saved the world more than a few times, and met the love of his life. But it's also where Gambit was blinded, frequently mind-controlled, and most importantly, became a horseman of Apocalypse. It all started as a plan to get an X-Men on the inside of Apocalypse's organization, but Apocalypse ended up taking over Gambit's mind and Gambit became a full-on horseman. He even tried to kill Rogue in an attempt to free himself from his past life. And while he was eventually freed, there was a while where Gambit was living with this dark horseman side suppressed in his psyche, but it would frequently break out and cause trouble. I wasn't a huge fan. At his best, Gambit is a charmer. And I mean that literally. One of Gambit's mutant powers is a superhuman level of influence, sort of like a Jedi mind trick that makes everyone agree with him. It's not enough to change everybody's mind, but the average Joe or Jane is usually susceptible to Gambit's charisma. So our Gambit needs to be charming, which shouldn't be difficult since most actors are, but it is a requirement here. Besides just being charming, Gambit's also handsome. I wouldn't say he needs to be a male model, although this Hellfire Gala cover might beg to differ but he's got a James Dean rebel without a cause sort of look. He's a bad boy and specifically he has piercing pink or purple eyes so we need an actor with striking features. Speaking of striking, Gambit is explosive and I'm not just talking about his powers. While he has the ability to be subtle, after all, master thief, 
Gambit usually has a huge personality, he is impossible to miss, and his absolutely insane outfit from the 90s sells that immediately. We need an actor who will not be overpowered by the pink and blue hockey pads. And most importantly, Gambit loves Rogue, has from the start. And like I said, their relationship was rocky, but it has turned into the most consistent X-Men relationship save for maybe Gene and Scott. We need someone who is passionate, has experience on screen as both a flirt and a boyfriend. One last thing that might be tricky. Gambit is very Cajun, so we need an actor who can make that accent work, and it ain't an easy one. In fact, I would say Cajun might be the toughest American accent to fake, so we need someone with accent experience. Previous versions. Was Taylor Kitsch a bad choice to play Gambit? I do not think so. That movie was bad, and also it didn't really need Gambit. And also, since the movie was supposed to take place in the main continuity, it was sort of a bummer that this Gambit had a good 25 years on Rogue, should they ever have met. That being said, I think his seven lines of dialogue sort of worked. His energy was fine. His accent was fine. The do I owe you money introduction was cute. So I don't think he was that bad. The movie just could not support him. He had no business being part of it. And that fight scene between him, Wolverine, and Sabretooth was pretty silly. But like nothing egregious. The runner's up. So let's ask this question. Do we have any high profile Cajun actors who can do Remy justice? After all, it's a tricky accent and it would sure be easier if the actor did not need to learn it. So. Do we have any actors from Louisiana? Anybody at all? I'll take any famous actor. Well, I guess there's not. What a bummer. There is Jake Wynn Wilson. Dude was on NCIS New Orleans in that Purge show. He's got the look and he is from Louisiana. I am not sold on him as this kind of leading man, but if we absolutely need a gambit from the area, we can do worse. And then we've got Channing Tatum. Listen, I think Channing Tatum is very talented. He is funny, he's quite charming, and an excellent dancer. However, I would not say he quite feels like Gambit to me, in terms of his body or his attitude. He's not particularly slick. He doesn't have quite the edge I would expect. I could see him as another X-Men, who we'll talk about in a future video, but I don't know. I just never got Gambit from Tatum. I understand the appeal. Channing Tatum liked Gambit. He was a big star. He probably came to Marvel and was like, hey, can I be Gambit? And they were like, yeah, okay. Kind of like The Rock with Black Adam. But I think if we're starting from scratch, we can do better. So let's look at two runners up that I think could absolutely play a fun Gambit. Channing Tatum's Magic Mike co-star, Alex Pettifer, feels a lot more Gambit to me. He played John in I Am Number 4, and he was also in what I genuinely believe might be the worst show I have ever seen, The Island. Trust me, it's bad. But he didn't write it, as far as I know. Then we've got Elvis, aka Austin Butler. Butler is electric, sexy, dangerous, he is trouble. And that accent is a tricky one, so I've got to give him credit, and I imagine he can figure out Cajun. And while he's clearly handsome, he's got what I would call an interesting face, and I love that for Gambit. He's from the streets, he's not necessarily a male model. So Butler is my first runner-up, but the winner. I was not particularly sold on Euphoria's Jacob Elordi until very recently. Honestly, I'd heard his name floating around, but it was not until his Hot Ones appearance that he was on my radar. But let's start here. Elordi is Australian, and he manages a solid American accent. I have no doubt that he could nail Cajun. Elordi also seems smart. Most of this came from that interview, but he seems thoughtful when it comes to approaching a character. And I mean, just look at him. This guy is the spitting image of Gambit. Tall, handsome, and slim. Again, this is where Tatum lost me. Gambit is an acrobat, able to slip in and out of a building through those stupid laser grids that only work in movies. But most importantly, Elordi can be a bad guy. He is able to play Nate Jacobs, who as far as I can tell is as close as Euphoria has to a villain with grace. He is incredibly unlikable, but that really isn't easy. Sure, being liked is also tough, but taking a character like Nate and eating that role up shows me that Elordi is interested in challenging parts, and I really respect that. Now you may be wondering, wait a second, your rogue, Haley Lou Jackson, is currently 27 and Elordi is 22. Will that romance work? Yeah, why not? Five years isn't anything crazy. I think Elordi could play a bit older and Jackson could play a bit younger. They could meet in the middle in their mid-twenties. Plus, what's wrong with a rogue who's a little older than her gambit? It's a gap, but nothing that unusual, especially for the X-Men. So, Jacob Elordi is my gambit. 
Kitty Pride is the Little Sister, created in 1980 by John Byrne and Chris Claremont. Kitty was an attempt to bring some youthful energy to the team. She was the youngest member of the X-Men, one of the less radically designed X-Men, no blue skin or even a crazy haircut. In the Excalibur comics, Kitty would often lament the fact that she was sort of plain compared to her teammates like Rachel and Megan and couldn't get any attention. She sort of faded into the background. In actuality, Kitty is the hidden gem of the X-Men. You ask some big X-Men comics fans who their favorite X-Men is, and you're gonna get way more kitties than you'd expect. She was even ranked as IGN's 47th greatest comic book hero of all time. And sure, it's a pretty arbitrary list, but it does reflect the fan sentiment. She was higher than fellow X-Men Beast, Nightcrawler, Gambit, and a bunch of others who didn't even make the list. She even charted above Aquaman, Shazam, Black Panther, and came in just above Barry Allen. Comic fans love Kitty, and here's why. In my opinion, Kitty is relatable. Kitty is as close as the X-Men have to an everyman, the average POV character who can ground the audience in this crazy world. And yet, Kitty punches way above her weight class and wins. When offered the chance to join the New Mutants, a team of kids, Kitty declined, calling them X-Babies. She does not want to be at the kids' table. Kitty knows she can be as good as any X-Men. Also, I know I'm calling her Kitty. She has tons of different names. Kitty, Kate, Catherine, Ariel, Sprite, Shadowcat, Red Queen. It's really about your personal preference, kind of where you're introduced to the character. I know her most from Excalibur Comics and X-Men Evolution. So that's why I'm gonna call her Kitty. She has been at the heart of so many great X stories, doing incredible things. Kitty is the protagonist of the Days of Future Past storyline. She's a founding member of Excalibur. She led the team in the astonishing run, sacrificed herself to save the world, and then when she got better, comics, Kitty led the team again. During the Krakoan Age, she formed the Marauders and is currently doing pirate things. The writers clearly love Kitty Pride. Claremont, Whedon, I mean Daniel Radcliffe, Hickman, Duggan, and especially Brian Michael Bendis, who was at one point even on the hook to write a Kitty Pride solo movie, although that was before the Fox Disney merger was completed, so who the hell knows if that's still a thing. Kitty is also one of the few X-Men with a significant religious background. Her parents were Ashkenazi Jews, and Kitty takes that part of her life very seriously. She wears the Star of David on a necklace, celebrates Hanukkah, and on more than one occasion, Kitty has related persecution from her childhood to the anti-mutant prejudice that the X-Men face. I think that's a super important aspect of Kitty's comic origin we need to keep, especially since I've been very vocal about the fact that I believe Magneto should also retain his Jewish heritage. So I like having Kitty on the other side of that as a counterweight. Yes, their experiences are very different, but yet these two people who've seen the same struggle and ended up at different conclusions. It's too interesting to lose on either side. And while Kitty is frequently playing the little sister role, that doesn't mean she stayed there. Kitty is serious. She became a teacher, a leader, and she climbed the ladder to the highest rung, pirate. Kitty is a good friend to many of the X-Men. Storm even described Kitty as the daughter she'd never had. Sorry, Chimera. Kitty's best friend on the team is almost certainly Kurt. The two bonded in Excalibur, and Kitty's been there for pretty much all of Kurt's X career. She is also the first cub that Logan got to Lone Wolf in their six-issue miniseries, Kitty Pride and Wolverine. And then, Kitty loved Colossus. She met Peter when she joined the team, and they had an on-again, off-again romance ever since. And by on again, off again, I mean one dies and then gets better, but then the other has died, and then when they get better, the other one is dead again, and so on and so on. They were even engaged, although Kitty did call it off at the last possible minute. But there's more to Kitty romantically than just being Colossus's crush. She has dated Star-Lord, Bobby, Peter Parker in the Ultimate Universe, Pete Wisdom, Cypher. So that's Peter, Pete Wisdom, Peter Parker. Peter Quill, that's a lot of people. Has anyone in comics ever just dated that many people of the same name? That's is pretty weird, isn't it? She's got a type. So all of those Peters plus Bobby and Cypher. And that was that, right, Marvel? Nobody else? Okay, cool. Hey, Marvel, be a deer and see if you can find this needle in this haystack for a second. It's right over there. Okay, cool. 
Kitty is very much bisexual and had a lot of wink wink Aunt Kate special friend relationships in a time when Marvel was not ready for an openly gay or lesbian hero. And then her relationship with Colossus's younger sister Ilyana was similarly very good friends, although I read their current relationship is a bit more explicit than before. When Kate was eventually resurrected on Krakoa for the first time, Ilyana appeared with a mariachi band and just tackled Kate, totally ready for some action. I mean, look at that face before being rudely interrupted by Sebastian Shaw, which was the second worst thing he did to Kate that month. The song that the mariachi band is playing was called De Contrabando, which is about a love affair that the partners need to hide from the world. So yeah, Ilyana is 100% Kitty's one true pairing, which is weird since she was very recently engaged to Ilyana's brother. Previous versions. Eh, I mean, I don't have strong feelings one way or another about Elliot Page's take on Kitty. That's probably mostly because that movie is bad, but my problem with X3 Kitty is that she never existed as more than a romantic rival for Rogue. And sure, you can do that, but that's definitely not what's fun about Kitty. And then, because no matter what the original source material says, Brian Singer refuses to make a movie that is not about Logan, Singer took her spot on Days of Future Past and gave it to the time-traveling Logan. In the original cut, Kitty even got herself stabbed, so she had to be replaced by Rogue. Oh, the irony. I would also love to point this out here. It does not have anything to do with casting, it's just a Kitty movie thought. She should be way more interesting in a fight. Just check out these panels from Marauders 1. If Kitty's powers are used creatively, she is borderline unstoppable. Couple that with the fact that she can destroy any piece of electronics she phases through, and you've got yourself a one-woman army. She can even kind of fly, kind of, kind of. Granted, I would not expect this in her first appearance, but this excellent Nightcrawler scene from X2 shows how creatively you should be able to use her powers too. The runner's up. Alright, so we're looking for actors on the younger side who can do a little bit of everything. It's not an easy one to cast, but I do have some ideas. I have heard a lot of people throw out Millie Bobby Brown for this one. And listen, I like her on Stranger Things. I watched about half of that Enola Holmes movie, and I can see the charisma. The thing is, as far as I can tell, she is not Jewish. So, while I think she could do it, I wouldn't say she's my favorite pick for the role. Next, let's talk about Margaret Qualley. She played Pussycat in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and stars in the Netflix series Made, which people seem to love. Another non-Jewish actor, and another knock against her, she's 27, which puts her a bit older than I'd like. I want a high school aged kitty, but if we're going for an older kitty, Quali would be a decent pick too. I was also recommended an actor named Neve Sultan. She's the lead in Apple TV's Tehran, where she plays a Mossad agent. This is the first actually Jewish actor on the list, so good. However, I'm not sure how she would sound as a kid from Chicago, since she doesn't seem to do American accents that often. Also, she's in her late 20s, so I'm not leaning towards her either. So, then, I was ready to go with Rachel Senat from Shiva Baby. I love that movie. She's the right age, got a slightly more chaotic energy than I would expect from Kitty, but it's nice to know that she can get there. And she's Jewish! Stars in a movie about a young Jewish girl at a Shiva, which is sort of like a Jewish funeral week thing. It was. Perfect. She's even a stand-up comedian, and I watched some clips of her before, and watching it again, and this line caught my attention. But I was raised Catholic, so I don't even know guys knew about periods. <laughs> I said, wait, raised Catholic? That's a weird jump to make, Catholic to Jewish. After all, she had to be Jewish, right? There's no way she could star in a movie like that without being Jewish. That just doesn't happen anymore. Well, to my surprise, she actually is not Jewish, which really bummed me out, because I think she could be a great Kitty Pride. She's young, funny, and a very talented actor, but them's the rules, so she's out too. But then you've got her co-star, Molly Gordon. She's actually Jewish, great start. In her mid-twenties, but could conceivably pass for younger. She's been in a ton of high school comedies like Booksmart and Good Boys. If we get a Kitty in college, I really think Gordon would be a great pick. The winner. I really, really, really did not want to do this, since I'm not a big fan of nepotism, but goddamn if Maude Apatow would not be the perfect Kitty Pride. Outside of playing the daughter in those movies her dad made, Maud made a name for herself as Lexi Howard on Euphoria. Lexi feels so much like Kitty to me. She's understated, the normal girl in a school full of lunatics, and yet she's able to command attention, yell, be heard. Kitty Pride can do anything, and we need an actor who can keep up. She's the perfect age, 24, she's Jewish, and she is a very talented actor. I really think Maude Apatow is the best Kitty Pride we've got. Jubilee is a teenager. Remember I said Kitty was the young one? Well, that was the 80s. A decade later, we met Jubilee. 
While Kitty was the younger sister, Jubilee was specifically a teenager, and she was written exactly like adults would write a teenager. She had cool slang, lived in a mall, didn't follow the rules, rollerbladed. And while Kitty would eventually grow up, Jubilee kinda didn't for a while. She was a perpetual teenager, and there's even a crazier reason why she never got old, which we will get to. Jubilee, or Jubilation Lee as she's named, was the child of two wealthy immigrants from Hong Kong, and everything was going great for Jubilee until her parents were murdered. And if that sounds like some sort of conspiracy, like those assassins are gonna show up later and be Jubilee's arch enemies, they aren't. The murder was a mistake. They were looking for another Lee family and got confused. We've all been there, accidentally assassinated the wrong family. It's an honest mistake. Jubilee was then sent to an orphanage but ran away and stayed in the mall, where teenagers go. She performed light shows, played arcade games, and then one day, mutant hunters showed up at the mall looking for Jubilee. It also happened that some of the X-Men were shopping at that mall at the same time, so they saved Jubilee and left through a portal. And right before the portal closed, Jubilee followed the X-Men through the portal to their secret base in Australia. So Jubilee snuck onto the X-Men, was not invited by the professor, did not know any of the other mutants, just saw an open door and walked through it. That might be the most interesting thing about Jubilee. She takes risks. She does what she wants. She does not ask for permission, which is a very teenager thing to do. Jubilee is also, and I might be wrong about this, the first mutant or one of the first mutants with a specifically West Coast sensibility. She was born in Beverly Hills and grew up in Hollywood. Jubilee is carefree, does not listen to authority, likes to have fun, and that attitude could rub some of the X-Men the wrong way, but her personality is a welcome addition to the X-Men who are a little too often kind of an East Coast all business vibe. So our Jubilee actor needs to be able to have fun. Someone with a background in comedy is probably a good place to start. And that's really the heart of the character. Jubilee is loud. She calls herself Jubilee because with her, quote, every day is a celebration. And that is manifested both in the absolutely insane 90s wardrobe, which was a lot even for Jim Lee at the time, but also her mutant abilities. Jubilee can create something called plasmoids, which she seems to shoot out of her fingertips. They usually look like fireworks, and when she was introduced, they basically were. They're bright, they're colorful, and even frequently on the television shows, they come with a fireworks sound effect. However, under further examination, it has been revealed that Jubilee can actually, and I'm quoting Emma Frost here, detonate matter at a subatomic level. She can make little nuclear explosions. And Jubilee knows this, but she consciously refuses to cause that much damage in fear that she will kill people, which she probably would. Jubilee is one of those mutants with a silly sounding power that when you really get down to it, could like kill Iron Man if she wanted. As a member of the X-Men, Jubilee is down for whatever. On a team of nothing but adults, she could easily play the kid role, get scared constantly, get worried, but she's sort of fearless. Maybe this has something to do with her past as an orphan, living in a mall. Maybe it's something she does just to fit in or maybe Jubilee just really is that brave. But either way, much like Kitty, Jubilee does not want to sit at the kids' table. She is a real X-Men. But beyond the X-Men, Jubilee's been on a few different teams, most notably Generation X. Led by Banshee and Emma Frost, Generation X was sort of an attempt to reboot the X-Men in Massachusetts. It's pretty much just another New Mutants led by two veterans. In my opinion, Jubilee never really fit onto the team. After all, she was already an X-Men. What was she doing back on the JV squad? Her time on the team was not a total waste. Jubilee made some Generation X friends like Husks and John or Jono, I'm never quite sure how that's pronounced, aka Chamber, who she would eventually have sort of a thing with, although I'm not sure where we are with that now. I mean, the Generation X Volume 2, like the more recent one, was maybe five years ago, and I feel like we don't see anything from that relationship, but whatever. On the X-Men, Jubilee gets along with Professor X, Beast, Magic, and X-23 the best. And of course, Jubilee, like Kitty before her, became a good friend of Wolverine. They hung out right as Jubilee came on the scene. The two even had a team-up comic after Jubilee became a vampire. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't mention this. In one of my favorite comics or crazy storylines, for almost a decade, Jubilee was just a complete vampire. Fangs, drank blood, the whole nine. Basically, during a vampire war, Zarus, the son of Dracula, sent a vampire suicide bomber to explode and infect Jubilee with his blood. It worked, and she was eventually bitten by Zarus, which turned her into a full-blown vampire. But she didn't go bad. Jubilee subsisted off of synthetic blood, supplemented by Wolverine's own blood and its healing factor. Jubilee has since been cured, but it signaled sort of an evolution for the character. She became a little darker, more cynical. Jubilee is also a mother, although her son Shogo just kind of showed up, like some sort of weird HBO show that no one watches even, I keep telling people. 
watch the baby. It's pretty good. It's become an interesting dynamic in recent X comics, especially since while in other world, Shogo can turn into a dragon. I think Shogo is important. Obviously not something to start with, but somewhere for Jubilee to go. She can't just be a rebellious teenager forever, and Shogo gives her someone to be responsible for. He grounds Jubilee. One last thing. Jubilee is an incredibly skilled gymnast, so it would help if we had someone with some athletic chops. Previous versions. Jubilee certainly did have a few lines. She said things about Star Wars that one time, but man, Lana Condor was robbed especially since she is the focus of the two best scenes in X-Men Apocalypse. Jubilee serves as the ambassador for the school in this commercial for the Institute that was not part of the movie but was released online as a little extra. And then she goes to the mall with the other kids in this scene that was also not part of the movie because it was too good. It was too much of what the X-Men should be. So why would you put it in an X-Men movie? I mean, come on. Jubilee never used her powers on screen. However, in that deleted scene, she uses pyrotechnic blasts to start an arcade machine. So she's a criminal and she stole from the arcade and should go to jail. But that's the thing about Jubilee. If you put Jubilee into an X-Men movie, it has to be a little fun because that's what her powers are. They're fireworks. She rollerblades, goes to the mall, plays the arcade games. So the fact that these movies are always kind of so grim and serious, like yes, the X-Men are very frequently a very serious allegory for persecution, racism, homophobia, stuff like that. But they're also just fun. That's part of the appeal of the characters and the books and why so many people love the X-Men. So I think Jubilee should be a big part of these movies in the future because if they put her in the movie, that will force the movie to be fun. Jubilee did not return for Dark Phoenix, the 90s one. To be fair, Lana Condor was busy during Dark Phoenix, so Jubilee does not show up. But if she did, I'm sure she would say hello and tell the switch back to the future movie she liked the most. And let's not forget, Jubilee was also part of that Generation X TV pilot from 1996. And in this pilot, Jubilation Lee, the daughter of two immigrants from Hong Kong, is played by Heather McComb, who is very white. According to director Jack Shoulder, nothing in the script or casting info signified that Jubilee was Asian, so they didn't look for Asian actors, and nobody thought that was weird for the whole time while they were filming it. So, you know, I'm just gonna throw this one out now. Jubilee should be played by an actor with some Asian heritage. Hong Kong would be great, but Asian's a good start. And honestly, that Generation X movie, besides that and some of the other really weird choices that movie makes, because, like, it's bad. It's very bad. It is not good. But, like, some of it's kind of good. The characterization of Jubilee is not bad. The characterization of Emma Frost and Banshee I kind of like. Like, yeah, the villain's insane. The effects are not good. Some of the characters, like Mondo, is not a good version of Mondo. But, like, some of the other stuff works, and it's like... You know, I don't know. It's just weird. It's a weird little artifact of the 90s when they didn't really know what to do with the X-Men before the movies, but while the cartoon was kind of going, so... I don't know, it's weird. The runners up. Here's the thing. If you just look at who should play this role based on their experience, their profile, their general vibe, and ignore all the X-Men movies before it, it's still Lana Condor. She's only gotten more popular since Apocalypse came out. My concern is that she's gonna be too old. If they started filming today, she would be 25. And I do think the character of Jubilee should start at like 15. It'll definitely help to get a younger actor for this role. So I have tried to narrow the focus of the casting to younger actors. Everybody on this list is under 21. And that's where things get complicated. Not only do most of them not have a lot of experience, the experience most of them have is child actor experience. So that probably won't translate since child actors are mostly bad. Even the ones that are above average aren't very good. And that's fine, they're children. It would be weird if we expected a 10 year old to be able to play tennis against Serena Williams. So why do we expect them to share scenes with Brian Cox, the Serena Williams of acting? Anyway, it's tough to judge the acting skills and range of an actor who is the right age for Jubilee. That being said, I'm going to try my best. First, let's look at Madison Who. She is currently 21, so we're on the right track. The veteran of a Disney Channel show about YouTubers, Madison proved that she can handle anything by co-starring in this show, The Zardivark, alongside Jake Paul. Madison seems talented. She can also sing. That's not something Jubilee is known for, but I figured I'd mention it. She has also been in the film Voyagers alongside ex-alum Ty Sheridan, and she's working on a series called The Brother Son on Hulu. She definitely seems like someone on the up, so she could probably handle Jubilee. Then we've got Anna Cathcart. She stars alongside Lana Condor in the To All The Boys series. She's also in the Descendants series. Listen, not a whole lot to go off here, but she's 20, so we're actually in the age range that feels like where Disney will end up. She seems professional, so she's probably a fine pick. But I did get a comment when I 
posted this image on Twitter from someone named Henry. And I just want to quote Henry here because I don't know too much about this actor and she was not on my radar during the initial casting, which is weird for a reason that'll come up later. Henry suggested someone named Ashley Liao. She's most known for playing a character on Fuller House, but she's also in the new series Physical. She has a pretty solid amount of experience in sitcoms, which like I said, is something that would be helpful for Jubilee since she is light and fun. She's also got a spot in the new Hunger Games prequel movie, which would lead me to believe that she's someone that other casting directors are like, she's good, she's the future. So I definitely think Ashley Liao would be a solid pick for this role. She is my first runner up. She is also in a little Disney Plus movie called The Secret Society of Second Born Royals, which I have not watched, but it does contain another actor who might be worth looking at. The winner, Peyton Elizabeth Lee, feels like the right pick for Jubilee. She was the lead in The Secret Society of Second Born Royals. She also currently stars on Doogie Kamealoa, MD, a spiritual successor to the show Doogie Howser, MD, about a young doctor. She also starred on a Disney Channel show called Andy Mack, which was not the spiritual successor to Alex Mack a show about a girl who could turn into a puddle. Lee can play a character with attitude, but more importantly, her character Lahala is constantly arguing and hanging around adults, the other doctors at the hospital, and they don't trust Lahala because she is a child prodigy. So you get a taste of what that dynamic where Cyclops will tell Jubilee that her mission's too dangerous and she's too young and then Jubilee will get angry and sneak into the Blackbird anyway. You get an idea of what that dynamic's gonna look like. The thing that sold me on Lee is her composure. All of these actors can act like bratty teenagers. They are child actors, the brattiest teenagers that ever existed. So I am looking for someone who has proven that they can handle pressure. Lee has been the lead in two series, one of which was on the Disney Channel, and the other one premiered last year on Disney+, Plus, which shows me that Disney is confident in Lee as an actor and as someone who can lead a franchise like that. In conclusion, Peyton Elizabeth Lee feels like the right pick for Jubilee. Bishop is a cop. I'm be honest, I don't really like Bishop. This is the first character I could say this about, and this background bit is not designed to dunk on Bishop. If you're a Bishop fan, that's great. In fact, tweet at me or comment here about why you like Bishop because I am genuinely curious. Lucas Bishop is from a future. The Days of Future Past Future, specifically. In case you don't remember from the movie, that's the one where the Sentinels take over. The catalyst of the takeover changes over time, but it's usually an assassination or something like that. Bishop's parents were Aboriginal Australians who fled to the States and were put into mutant re-education camps. That's where he got the famous M tattoo. As a child, Bishop was told stories about the X-Men, who in his time had no longer existed. He heard these stories from his grandmother, who was probably Storm, but I don't know if that was ever confirmed. Later, Bishop was also taught by someone who sure seems like Gambit, but I don't think that was ever confirmed either. Both mentors told Bishop about a brave mutant fighting force who protected mutants from the people who hated and feared them, and Bishop idolized the legendary X-Men. After something called the Summer's Rebellion, Bishop and his little sister Shard were freed from their concentration camps and lived on the streets. It was then that Bishop learned about the Exhumes, a militant mutant group of anti-human terrorists. Bishop mistakenly assumed that that was what the X-Men were like and idolized the Exhumes. This is where we get into what I believe might be Bishop's two defining traits. First, Bishop is tough. He survived the Days of Future Past timeline and lived on the streets with his sister. He is a survivor. And then second, Bishop is wrong. Throughout his history, Bishop has been wrong a lot, makes assumptions that turn out to be way off, sometimes getting him into trouble. The Exhumes X-Men comparison is a benign example of this, but it gets much worse as time goes on. But the Exhumes were stopped by the XSE, which stands for Xavier's Security Enforcers. They are basically mutant cops. Bishop and Shard immediately joined the XSE, and Bishop rose through the ranks to become their captain. So Bishop is a cop. Yes, he is a time cop, but not on purpose, because he accidentally went back in time when a mutant named Trevor Fitzroy created a time prison break and landed all of the criminals and some of the XSE in the present timeline. And Bishop just went from there, copping around in the present. And also, he's not a great cop. Like I said, he is wrong a lot. Like when Bishop met Gambit in the present timeline, he assumed Gambit was his mentor, which he did seem to be, but then wrongly connected Gambit to a message he saw in the future that suggested his mentor was going to destroy the X-Men. He demanded that Professor X read his mind, and the Professor refused, and everyone vouched for Gambit, but that still wasn't enough for Bishop. This led to a big fight that made Bishop look like a fool, especially since the traitor would eventually end up being Onslaught, and the message referred to the part of Professor Xavier's psyche that was Onslaught being the traitor. This gets 
gets at my other problem with Bishop. He's frequently written as an authoritarian, commanding Xavier to read Gambit's mind, taking matters into his own hands under the guise that he is the law. Even during Civil War, when Bishop really didn't have anything at stake since the X-Men largely sat it out, Bishop joined Iron Man's team to keep tabs on Captain America. He believes in the law above all else. Bishop even, in his most embarrassing moment, attempted to kill a child. We've all heard the would you kill baby Hitler argument. Well, Bishop is not only on the pro side, but is ready to kill baby Hitler and Bishop's own friend and teammate who is protecting the baby and saying like, Bishop, listen, I know you want to kill baby Hitler because you think it's the right thing to do, but I know it's not the right thing to do, so don't do it. And Bishop's just like, nope, I'm shooting you and the baby. During the Messiah Complex storyline, Hope Summers, the first mutant born since Scarlet Witch made most of the mutants lose their powers, was being protected by her adopted father, Cable. Bishop and Cable had fought together before like they were friends, but Bishop believed Hope would bring on the days of future past future, and even though everyone Bishop knew was telling them that he needed to keep Hope alive, Bishop called an audible, shot Cable, and attempted to shoot Hope, but was stopped at the last minute by Cyclops. And then the icing on the cake, Bishop tried to kill Hope again and accidentally shot and killed Professor X. Bishop keeps making mistakes, which is fine. The problem comes from the fact that he never seems to learn from them. Even when he is proven objectively wrong, Bishop doesn't examine his wrong assumptions and use more restraints in the future. Bishop just keeps going because he has the authority and that means he should be able to do whatever he wants. Again, cop. And this would be a little easier to excuse if time travel in the Marvel comics was as cut and dry as Bishop thinks it is. But it's pretty consistently proven that changes in the timeline have significant effects on the future and everything is not set in stone. Bishop is not just the villain in Minority Report in this situation, he's the villain in a Minority Report sequel where everyone knows that predicting crime doesn't really work and Bishop still listens to the precogs because he just does. Bishop cops on vibes. And also, sure, he's a cop from the future, but Bishop is not a time cop charged with protecting the sacred timeline or whatever. He is just a cop who ended up in the past, but he has no past training, no mandate to fix things, and in my opinion, that makes all of these shenanigans way worse. Now, Bishop sometimes plays a role closer to a detective. During the Extreme X-Men series and District X, Bishop was less concerned with enforcing the law and more concerned with using his abilities to solve crimes and protect people in the present. And I think that was the right move for Bishop. He's clearly intelligent, he was trained by the XSE, and someone who was probably Gambit. He has some knowledge of the future, so if Bishop spends more time investigating and less time accusing, his eventual assumptions will be supported by evidence, and he has some actual authority to enforce the law. And that's why a lot of people's favorite Bishop story is Bishop the Last X-Man, in which Bishop is transported from the present day to a future where his nemesis Trevor Fitzroy is in control. Bishop switches from cop to soldier in a dystopian war against Fitzroy, and it's here that Bishop seems to work the best. He is a soldier in the middle of a conflict that he has little control over. He does not hold authority over the rest of the people he's fighting alongside. He is not enforcing laws. They are all working together as equals, and he can lead them, but he is not above them. Bishop works when he is protecting people, using his powers to take a hit and save a mutant in trouble. And sometimes this results in a shootout, but that's not all he's doing. Speaking of his powers, Bishop does have a very fun mutant ability. He can absorb energy and redirect it. So if you shoot Bishop with some laser gun or something, he can take that blast and shoot it back to you, usually through his fists. Bishop can also use the absorbed energy to augment his own strength and do a big punch. And when I say energy, I mean everything, like a grenade, lightning, fire, plasma. He can even absorb psychic energy, although he doesn't do that often because it doesn't make that much sense. Bishop also has an excellent sense of location. He always knows where, and more importantly, when he is. It's unclear if this is a mutant power or just something he learned somehow, but it is part of his kit. Bishop also sports a lot of guns. Some are big, silly future guns. Some are smaller, silly present guns. But overall, Bishop is one of the few X-Men who uses a firearm. Bishop is also sometimes drawn as a humongous man, like Bruce Tim upside down triangle man huge, so I can see why people expect a movie bishop to also be super buff. I am less convinced it is an essential bishop trait, after all, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Bishop is from a dystopian future, I'm not saying he needs to be scrawny, but like where does he get all this protein? Most recently in the comics, Bishop is the second in command of the Marauders, a group of mutant pirates who protect other mutants. He has slimmed down a ton. 
Still a big guy, but not a refrigerator. I think that's a good middle ground for Bishop. And this sort of team is the perfect place for Bishop. A bit of investigating and a lot of protecting. He's a great teammate. He follows orders from his captain, Kate Pride. Bishop will throw himself into a war zone to protect another mutant. He is tough headstrong and determined, and more often than not, it causes Bishop trouble. But when written right, Bishop can be a good soldier who rubs people the wrong way, but ultimately puts his ego aside for the cause. Previous versions. We have had one Bishop, and he might have one line. He was played by Omar Sy, solid casting, but just didn't do all that much. He has a gun that he shoots, and he takes some electricity from Storm, and then even though in the comics Bishop might not have an upper limit to what he can absorb, this Bishop absorbs three beams and explode. Goes out like a huge chump. I do want to point out that Cable's arc in Deadpool 2 is very similar to Bishop's in the Messiah Complex line. Comes back in time to kill a kid who he thinks will ruin everything, but he's wrong. The runner's up. Okay, so this is a kind of difficult one. We're looking for a tough black dude, but part of the trouble here is that there's really not an ideal age for Bishop, nowhere to narrow it down. Bishop's creator has suggested that Idris Elba would work, and if Elba was not already Heimdall, I would say that was good, but he's nearly 50. I'd also be fine with a 30-year-old Bishop, even a 70-year-old Bishop. It all depends on what they choose to do with this character. I say 30 is my floor because I think you want a bishop who's like seen some stuff, lived through a war, and come out a new man. He's also risen to the top of the XSE, so you know, that takes some time. I've heard Yahya Abdul-Mateen II thrown around a lot. I don't mind him. I imagine he might be superheroed out after Watchmen and Aquaman, but he would definitely be able to bring some of the same energy to the role that he does in Black Manta. He's headstrong thinks he has a responsibility to enforce his will. Plus, he's pretty built and tall. I also think we've got to give some consideration to Laz Alonzo. You probably know Laz from The Boys, where he plays M.M., the voice of reason on the Soup Killing Squad. His performance this season has been incredible, and I think he could bring that same pathos to Bishop. We'd be looking good. I've been looking for somewhere to put John Boyega for a while now. Maybe Bishop is that character. He has a ton of charm. He's already played a police officer who defects in Force Awakens. Those movies did him dirty, but they proved that he could handle this sort of role. My first runner-up, and hear me out, is Jessica Jones's Eka Darville. I know what you're thinking. First off, he's already on Jessica Jones, sure, but I doubt they'll bring that show back exactly the same way, plus he could easily be killed off. Second, you might be saying, well, he's not a giant muscle man, and I guess so. He's not humongous, but he is still a hunk. Darville is also Australian, which is part of Bishop's heritage. Darville also has the look that Bishop currently sports in Marauders, the hair, the frame, and I really like Darville on Jessica Jones. I think he would make an excellent Bishop. The winner. Like I said with Magneto, sometimes the internet is just right. Moonlight's Travante Rhodes would be a terrific Bishop. You more than likely know Rhodes from Moonlight, where he plays the older version of Chiron. He also had supporting roles in The Predator and Bird Box. Rhodes is such a talent, and he's also a hunk. I don't see why he's not made it into a superhero movie yet. Maybe he just doesn't want to? In that case, more power to him, make way for Darville. But if Rhodes wants Bishop, it should be his. He is tough. Besides his character in Moonlight, Rhodes just finished up a bio series about Mike Tyson that aims to show all sides of the heavyweight champ, from the dominant force in the ring to the complicated figure outside of it. Mike looks poised to show Rhodes off as someone with a lot of range, and I would love to see Rhodes take on the role of Bishop in the MCU. Psylocke is... Hmm. Psylocke is... Oh, okay. You may not know the whole story. It's silly, but not quite as complicated as you may imagine, so I'm going to try to give you the best version of the Psylocke, Betsy, Canon body swapping story that I can. I think it's important to understand the difference between both personalities since they are different people who keep popping in and out of each other's lives and keeping track of them can be kind of confusing. So here's what happened. We start in 1976 with Captain Britain 8. We learn that Betsy and her twin brother Brian were born to the Braddocks, a wealthy British family. Betsy led a charmed life as a supporting character in her brother Brian's Captain Britain adventures. Betsy was a pilot, she was a model, she could kind of see the future kind of, but more or less, Betsy had a good time when she wasn't being kidnapped or whatever. Eventually, Betsy became a full-on mutant. Telepathy, lots of pink energy, and purple hair. With her new powers, Betsy joined Strike, the UK Shield, and became a spy. And then, when Brian needed to abandon his post as Captain Britain, Betsy took it up and had some adventures that left Betsy blinded, which 
bad but not career ending since she could still use her telepathy to sort of see. However, Mojo, who I explained in a Nebula video, kidnapped Betsy, gave her cybernetic eyes, and the name Psylocke. Cool name. Then, in 1986, Psylocke joins the X-Men after she defends the X-Mansion from an attack led by Sabretooth. And Betsy joins right in time to get killed with all the rest of the X-Men and then revived in secret by Roma, a multiversal guardian. They live in Australia for a while. But then, Betsy has a vision that the team needs to abandon their base and sends everyone through something called the Siege Perilous, a magic do-over device. Cut to Uncanny X-Men 255 in 1989. Betsy comes out of the Siege Perilous in Japan and is found by The Hand, a bunch of evil ninjas, and brainwashed into being one of their assassins. And since they need someone who could blend in better in Japan, they gave Betsy plastic surgery to make her look like this. However, this was a cover identity that was created for Betsy. She was born looking like a white girl in Britain, but got plastic surgery and turned into this. Was it racist? Kind of, although that's not the entire story, it was not intended to stay that way, but people loved the design by Jim Lee, so it did. Betsy became the ninja we're familiar with, joined up with the X-Men, was all good, but actually. Four years later, while Psylocke was hanging out in the X-Mansion trying to seduce Scott Summers, because that's just what she did for fun those days, another character appeared claiming to be Betsy, kind of. She called herself Revanche, and she looked like this. Betsy pre-surgery, but that didn't make any sense. Betsy just got surgery, right? Why would there be a second version of her running around? Well, here's the thing. Fabian Nicieza, who was writing X-Men at the time, had not read X-Men 255, the issue with the plastic surgery explanation. He just thought the whole Betsy Psylocke thing was an open-ended mystery that he was going to solve. Here's the explanation that we get a few years later in X-Men 31, the one they ended up sticking with. Betsy washed up in the shore of Japan after the Siege Perilous trip and was rescued by a ninja working for the Hand named Kenon, spelled K-W-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, her. Kenon worked for a crime boss named Yorian, but was in love with a ninja from another faction who was named Matsuo Troyaba. Kenon touched Betsy and the two became linked by Betsy and Kenon's psychic powers. Then, during a duel with Matsuo, Kenon fell off a cliff and her brain was badly damaged, basically brain damaged. Uh-oh, Matsuo doesn't know what to do, but he finds the comatose Betsy, and because of her previous connection to Kenon, Matsuo comes up with a plan. He brings the brain-dead Kenon to the Mandarin who keeps her alive. Then, Matsuo convinces Mojo's henchman Spiral to heal both women and sort of use Betsy to do a psychic jumpstart on Kenon's brain. Then Matsuo's Kenon will be healed and Matsuo and the Mandarin can use her as a psychic ninja to do murders. She would not have done this before, since she and Matsuo were part of dueling assassins guilds, but she's gonna have her mind wiped. Nobody really cares what happens to Betsy, but Niorian decides to nurse Betsy back to health. So Matsuo needs Mandarin's help to restore Kanon. Mandarin needs a new assassin, but Spiral, Mojo's assistant who does the magic necessary for the jumpstart, also hates Betsy. So when she was doing the psychic jumpstart, Spiral messed with both women. Imagine their minds are bowls of soup. She basically took both mind soups out of their body and mixed them together in a big bowl, then made a new mind soup and poured the new soup into both women. So both women had a mind that was half Canon and half Betsy, which means both women had some Betsy hidden in there. But since Mandarin planned to mentally condition Canon anyway, this should really not have been a problem. So that's what happened. And then Matsuo took Canon and Nyorin took Betsy, who also now looked sort of Asian for some reason. Kanon goes on being an assassin for the Mandarin and runs into Wolverine, who recognizes her but knows something's wrong. And when she tries to stab him with her psychic knife, it backfires and unlocks the Betsy part of her mind. From this point forward, Kanon fully believes she is and has always been the only Betsy, but she looks like this. But we all called her Betsy and she joined the X-Men. Everything you associate with Psylocke, bathing suit, purple hair, psychic knife, Asian features, and a British accent. But then this Betsy shows up in May of 1993 and they both think they're the real Betsy because they both have a little bit of Betsy's mind soup and they both look like a version of Betsy, and Professor X cannot tell their minds apart, Logan cannot smell a difference between them, so they just both hang around. This one calls herself Revanche, and this one is Psylocke. But then, Revanche gets the legacy virus and dies in April of 1994, and she stayed dead for a little while. In the meantime, Psylocke, now the only Betsy, remains on the X-Men. She is killed, but resurrected, and gains the power to teleport, and a red mark on her face, 
Then she joins the Extreme X-Men and is killed again. This time she's resurrected by her brother, Jamie, who has the ability to warp reality. Jamie brings Betsy back because he knows the X-Men need her to fight a villain called the First Fallen. Fast forward to 2007, we've got the Exiles days. Lots of multiverse hopping and stuff, not super important. But Psylocke gets captured by the villain Madeline Pryor, and Pryor digs up Revanche's body and transfers Betsy's mind into Revanche. So now we have a fully Betsy Revanche. Pryor mind controls Betsy into fighting the X-Men, Revanche is killed and Betsy takes over Psylocke's body again and new status quo is returned and Revanche is dead again. Then 2010, Psylocke fights on Uncanny X-Force for a while alongside Wolverine, Angel, Phantom X, and Deadpool. Not super important. Some time passes. It's 2018. Wolverine dies, very sad, and a team of X-Men, basically all of the non-Gene Grey women, go to Madripoor to investigate the disappearance of Wolverine's corpse. One of the X-Men that comes along is Psylocke. And while they are in Madripoor, our team is ambushed by a team of villains led by Viper. Sure, whatever. Except, one of those villains is a psychic vampire named Sapphire Styx, who absorbs Betsy's mind and kills Betsy. But then, Betsy's consciousness inside Sapphire's mind takes over and Betsy rebuilds her own body atom by atom and is reborn. But it's the original white Betsy body, so Betsy is original Betsy again. And also, Kenon, in the Psylocke body, appears in Madripoor, so I guess she remade herself as well, or whatever, who cares. We are finally back to where we started. Betsy Braddock is a white girl with psychic powers, and Kenon is a Japanese ninja with psychic powers. And this is what we've been working with for the last few years. Kanon is her own person, goes by Psylocke, and Betsy is her own person who has taken up her brother's mantle of Captain Britain. Both women have psychic powers, and both women use purple or pink psychic swords. Betsy's is a broadsword, Kanon's is a katana. I need you to understand this whole story, because here's what I think they do in the movies. I think Betsy Braddock will be a supporting player in a Captain Britain movie or series. She will gain mutant powers, but largely stay with the Captain Britain powers. And they'll just call her Betsy, or Braddock, or even Revanche if they really want to, but probably not, because that name's difficult to say. She will probably hang out with the X-Men from time to time, but I bet she'll stay in Britain. Then, in another part of the world, a ninja named Kanon, who goes by Psylocke, will defect from her team of ninjas when she meets Wolverine, and he will take Psylocke back to the X-Men. Anything we associate with Psylocke will probably happen to Kanon. She will join the X-Force, join the Exiles, romance Angel, and perhaps the two will meet in a scene and compliment each other on their hair and psychic swords and make a joke about they should hang out more often. And that'll be that. This is a Marvel Cinematic Universe. This stuff, you know, it's it's a little easy to forecast. So I'm going to cast a Betsy and a Canon, and I'm going to try to map the personality traits to the version I believe they make the most sense with. Let's start with Betsy. Betsy is brave. More than anything else, I would describe Betsy Braddock as brave. That's always been her thing. She started out as a pilot. She took on her brother's position as Captain Britain without much training. She joined the X-Men after defending the X-Mansion from a mutant that would give veteran X-Men trouble. And then Betsy joined countless missions that ended up killing her and kept going. Even now, as the full-time Captain Britain, Betsy has taken on the difficult task of protecting all of the multiverse. She does not shy away from a challenge. And Betsy's relationship to the title of Captain Britain tells us a lot about what she wants. Growing up, Betsy was the second most important Braddock. And she always knew if she was chosen as Captain Britain, she would crush it. But outside of one short filling in for her brother, Betsy never got that chance. I do not think she feels the need to prove herself as much as she just wants to do it. Betsy has always envied Brian getting that responsibility, and when she got the chance, she jumped at the opportunity. Now, that does not mean Betsy is great at it. She's decidedly not. Part of this has to do with Betsy just not getting along with her multiversal boss, but a lot of the rest of it comes from Betsy's perhaps overconfidence in her abilities. Betsy also likes to do things by herself, and sometimes her reluctance to work with a team gets her in trouble. But that confidence comes in handy sometimes. So much of winning a fight as a psychic comes with believing in yourself and your abilities. And Betsy has a strong mind, strong enough to absolutely demolish many other psychics who underestimate her. And besides being a mutant, Betsy is magic. Her father is from Otherworld, which I get at a lot more during Brian's bit in the Nebula Companion video for this video, more on that later, but for now, Otherworld might as well be Narnia. 
So Betsy has a magical side that she cannot ignore, but unlike her brother, Betsy is also a mutant and walks the line between those two worlds. Which is especially difficult currently since the mutant nation of Krakoa is seen as a threat to the rest of the world. And this goes without saying, but Betsy Braddock is British, so we need a British actor to fill this role especially since she's probably going to be Captain Britain eventually, if not right away. Previous versions. I'm gonna go ahead and say we have never had a proper Betsy Braddock in a movie the Psylocks were familiar with skew much closer to Ken on. The runner's up. Okay, so we need British actors with confidence and a chip on their shoulder. Age-wise, I want an adult, let's say over 30, specifically because I have a Captain Britain in mind, and I don't think anyone under the age of 30 could make a convincing twin which counts out some actors I like, like Jodie Comer, Olivia Cook, and Daisy Ridley, but they've got plenty of other roles that they could fit into. Some will come up in the future. I had to put a lot of thought into whether Felicity Jones had even been in one of these MCU movies yet. As far as I can tell, she's not. Closest she's gotten is as the assistant named Felicia in Amazing Spider-Man 2. I think Jones can sell the privileged origins of Betsy quite well, and she's got experience as an action heroine in Rogue One, so I don't hate it. Ooh, or what about Imogen Poots? Super silly name, but solid actor. Loved her in Green Room and Popstar. I've heard good things about Outer Range. She's just another one who I can't quite count out here. Is this where Emma Watson ends up? Maybe, but I wish I had seen Watson in a more physical role before. Betsy, like her brother, is sort of a brawler. She makes psychic swords and swings around like a maniac, and I don't know what that looks like with Emma Watson. Kira Knightley, however, now that is a British actress who knows how to sword fight and also has a bit of an edge, which I really like. I also remember a period in the 2000s with movies like Atonement, The Duchess, and Pride and Prejudice that positioned Kira Knightley as the epitome of a British royal who didn't really fit in, and that can very much be Betsy's energy. I only wish there was one of those movies that I just mentioned that had a little bit more action. That actor would be the perfect Betsy. The winner. Look who it is again. It's Lily James. Yep, I said I really liked her for Rogue, and a lot of that translates over to Betsy. She is confident, but also kind of a mess. Pam from Pam and Tommy has doing her best energy, and I want to see that in Betsy. When she becomes Captain Britain, she has a ton on her plate, and she is scrambling to keep the multiverse together. And like I hinted at, James plays Elizabeth in Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which yes, I know, dumb movie. But there's some top tier Britishness on display, as well as some great action choreography thrown in, and some of it is clearly James. That is a great Betsy Braddock audition. And James is actually British. I always forget this because she's such a convincing American, and I think she would be a believable twin for my Captain Britain, who I get into in my Nebula Plus companion video where I cast Excalibur, which is Brian Braddock, Megan, Rachel Summers, and of course, Saturnine. So I could see my Brian and my Betsy, Lily James, being twins. So Lily James is my Betsy Braddock. Kenon is intense. Kenon has a rough life, even without the body swapping. She was trained as an assassin by the hand. She had a baby, which they stole from her and was killed. Kenon is determined to not only get revenge, but make sure no one else suffers the same fate she did. One thing I love about Kenon is that Kenon kills. She is not messing around. We know this because she leads the Hellions, she has joined the Uncanny X-Force, but also after the body swap, Betsy came back different. So you have to assume that difference was mostly Kenon's personality influencing Betsy. And this Betsy did a bunch of murders. Like I said, she joined the X-Force led by Logan, which existed as a sort of off the books black ops squad to deal with problems that Cyclops, the public facing leader of the X-Men, could not deal with himself. And it made sense, Kenon was trained as a killer, so she brought that to Betsy. She even became addicted to killing, but that doesn't mean she likes it. That X-Force's first mission was to kill a reborn apocalypse, but when it turned out this apocalypse was a child who did not want to be evil, Betsy was not down with killing him. She's the first member of the team to say, hey, we probably shouldn't do this. And after Phantom X calls an audible and kills Kid Apocalypse himself, the rest of the team is broken up about it and it is Betsy who tells them it is okay to feel bad about this. I think a version of Betsy, who's sort of like Wolverine, does not want to kill, but will in specific circumstances, is the right middle ground for this character. And Kenon and Wolverine get along well, besides the fact that Wolverine frequently makes trips to Japan and is constantly fighting the hand, they both just have similar sensibilities and styles. They like to fight up close. They're both very serious. I hope that friendship is present in the MCU. One of the other things Kenon brought to Betsy was her sexiness. I know how it sounds, but she immediately started throwing herself at Scott. It was definitely a conscious decision. And who knows which came first? Was she drawn that way and then the writers just went with that? 
or was there a directive from the writers like we want a writer who's really sex positive character so jaw is a character who is walking around in a one piece bathing suit all the time does it really matter probably not but it became a part of betsy's personality after the brain swap she flirted with Scott, had a fling with Phantom X, is currently maybe with Grey Crow, and even had a long-term relationship with Angel. The two dated for a while, and she came back to Angel after he was resurrected. But that gets at one of the most interesting things about Kenon that really came out during Hellions. Kenon likes to take care of broken things. Her relationship with Warren came about during his Archangel phase. Warren was constantly suppressing the dark side that came from his days as Apocalypse's horseman and Betsy was a good influence on Warren. She kept him in check. Then during the Krakoan Age, Kenon is tasked with leading a team of mutants whose powers have made them, let's call it, antisocial. They're loose cannons, sociopaths, killers. But Betsy takes care of them, keeps them in line, and eventually grows to love her Hellions. Kenon also recruited X-23 to come with her and stop a drug ring during the Fallen Angels storyline. And when you think about it, those characters are super similar. Both raised to be killers who find a family on the X-Men, they don't totally give up their murderous ways, but their journey is about finding a healthy middle ground. Previous versions. So even though I don't think it's ever made explicit, I believe both on-screen Psylocke's skew closer to Kenon than Betsy. And now you're saying both? Yes, in X-Men The Last Stand, we get a full probably like 20 seconds of on-screen Psylocke. She is this mutant who hangs around Quills, and she doesn't really do much, so yeah, sure. But then in X-Men Apocalypse, Olivia Munn took a shot at Psylocke, and she was fine. I appreciate the look. It's kind of insane that she wore her goofy Psylocke costume to the concentration camp, but that's what happens when you mix the elements of the good X-Men movies and the other ones. I liked her power visualization there. The sword and psychic dagger combo was cool. Her fight scene was fine. I think she may have said, like, a word on screen. So, like with a lot of these characters, they didn't really bother to get at what is interesting about Psylocke. No fun psychic powers, no dark history, no indication that she was maybe a British woman, just the costume. It was a good costume, could have been worse. The runner's up. Should Olivia Munn get another shot? Well, I don't think she was a terrible Psylocke, but here's where she lost me. I don't find her particularly intense. She was angry and had what I feel like a pretty muted energy for Psylocke. Compare that to the boys' Karen Fukuhara, furious, violent, and tormented. I think Fukuhara is much closer to what I want from a Psylocke, and honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that she's already done so many comic book movies, she would be my pick, because she also plays Katana in the original Suicide Squad, and I try to find actors who already aren't known for a million superhero things, but Karen Fukuhara would be a solid canon. But let's look at some other people. You've got Hakura Abe, who plays Akiko in Snake Eyes. She had a few well choreographed martial arts scenes that were edited into a Bolivian, but I think her energy was on the right track. While she was also in 47 Ronin, she doesn't have a huge role, so I would like to see more from her before I decide she's a good Psylocke. Now, I have a question. How important is it that the actor playing Kenon is Japanese herself? After all, Olivia Munn's mother is Chinese and Vietnamese, and her dad is white. And a lot of the time in American blockbusters, actors with Asian heritage end up playing characters from anywhere in Asia. Lucy Liu is not Japanese, yet plays the half-Japanese Yakuza boss in Kill Bill. Colleen Wing, Japanese character, Singaporean Chinese slash English actor. Lady Deathstrike, Japanese character, Chinese English Hawaiian actor. I only ask because when looking into it, I found a really fun performance with the exact energy I would expect from a Psylocke. However, it comes from the Korean Kim Ok Bin. The movie in question is called Villainous, and it has some absolutely insane fight choreography. It also does that weird hardcore Henry first person stuff, but plenty of the film ignores that, thankfully. This movie is full of brutal, psychotic action, and I think someone like Kim with this background could bring something really interesting to the role. But if we are against using a Korean actor, which I totally understand, which is probably the wrong pick. You know who else might not be a crazy pick? Rinko Kikuchi starred in Pacific Rim as Mako Mori, also in Invasion and Tokyo Vice, two streaming shows I see commercials for and assume exist. But Mako Mori is the blueprint. Tragic past. Fights with swords. Has purple hair. What more could you want? The winner. This is my video. I get to pick. And damn it if one of my favorite movies of the last five years does not happen to be a Japanese movie starring, I assume, mostly Japanese actors. 
and one of them is a woman around the age you would expect for Kenon. It is a physical role, although not an action movie, and I just love it. So my Kenon Psylocke would be one cut of the deads, Yuzuki Akiyama. I don't want to say too much about this movie, because it really is a treat, but suffice it to say, Akiyama's role is demanding. She goes through a ton of emotions. She is constantly moving around. And she's a relative unknown, especially in the US, so I think Yuzuki Akiyama would be a fun pick for Kenon. So those seven are what I will call the next generation of X-Men. But I know what you're thinking. Hey, you keep talking about Captain Britain. I thought Betsy was Captain Britain. She currently is, but she has not always been Captain Britain. There is another character who led Excalibur, a really terrific X-Men series that a lot of fans love, that I think we probably will see in the future, maybe even before some of these other guys, because Captain Britain exists kind of outside of the regular X-Men continuity. Like, they could introduce him today and it would make enough sense. And I have a video where I cast Brian Braddock, Captain Britain, his wife, Megan, his teammate and friend, Rachel Summers, and of course his boss, Saturnine. And you can find that video exclusively on Nebula. I'm sure you've heard me or some other YouTuber talk about Nebula. Here's why you should get it if you've been enjoying these. I have three bonus videos on Nebula where I cast other characters. One, where I cast the characters from the Mojoverse, so Mojo, Spiral, Longshot, and Shatterstar. One, where I cast Wolverine's extended family, Laura, Gabby, and Akihiro. And now, one where I cast the Excalibur character. That only exists on Nebula, none of them will ever be on YouTube, and all of my other videos are on Nebula, there are tons of other videos from other creators you already love, and we have a bundle with this video sponsor, Curiosity Stream, where you can get Nebula and Curiosity Stream for less than $15 a year. Not a month, a year. And you get access to Nebula plus all of Curiosity Stream's high quality documentary content on things like swords and squirrels and even this one called super senses about how different animals have different senses like apparently butterflies can sense magnetism or something i don't know so go to curiositystream.com slash nando to sign up watch my exclusive nebula casting videos and i will see you soon for what i think maybe will be the final part in this series where i cast my personal favorite team of x-men x Factor. As always, huge thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon, everybody that watches these videos on Nebula, everybody that listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking, everyone who follows me on Twitter and Twitch, where I draw these sometimes. I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.